The last command we're going to talk about is Wireshark. Now Wireshark has a really slick graphical utility. If you're running in a graphical workstation or graph, maybe server with GUI, I don't know. Server you with GUI. Wireshark. And there's all kinds of like toggles and buttons and it's actually a pretty slick tool. But Nate, did you know that there's a terminal-based version of Wireshark? No, Scott, I totally didn't. Yes, I did. It's called T-Shark, right? So let me go ahead and make myself an extra screen here. We're gonna, I'm gonna tell it that I'm interested in capturing data on my ETH0 interface. And here it is, and I'm watching all the traffic come through live, right? But right. the interesting thing about Wireshark is actually not seeing it live per se, but being able to run analysis after the fact. But yeah. running T-Shark on the terminal, you need to save that data, right? Seeing it on your screen doesn't really help you a whole lot. But if you write that data to some file, But so capturing that data and you can see the number of packets. And when I do things like SSH to another host, oops, how about 10, 0, 5, 238. 10, 5, 0, so now I'm connecting to that box and that was captured in that packet capture that I did. Right. When you hit control C, it stops capturing the packets. And if I run T shark and I tell it to read my file, I actually captured one of these earlier. So I'm going to use that instead. There's all the packets it captured. But now that I have them stored in a file, I can do the extra analysis that Wireshark lets me do, which is, I think, right. where it's interesting. One of the most beneficial tools that I've found within Wireshark is being able to reconstruct the data that was actually passed as part of these connections. So like you can see the packets that were passed, but was actually in those packets. And not only what was in the packets, but was it interesting or useful? Right. One of the things you could do for TCP formatted packets, because they're based off of TCP sessions, which is a whole collection of data that is transferred between the two hosts for a specific connection. You can actually have Wireshark list what all the available TCP sessions are. So I'm going to let me grab my, oh, maybe I won't. A presentation on reassembling an entire VoIP conversation. That is a voice over IP telephone conversation via Wireshark. They were able to capture the entire conversation and replay it, which is pretty crazy. Yeah. All right, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying, go into my log file that I captured earlier, look for TCP connections, that log file. I'm interested in the fields out of the packets that match TCP type and specifically a TCP stream number for all of those connections. Here's all of the packets and the number being displayed is the TCP session ID of each of the individual packets captured in that 400 packet capture. But that's a lot of data. And so what I'm really gonna do is I'm gonna take that list and pipe it to sort. I'm gonna unique it and have it sorted by number. So there were 24 unique TCP sessions in that packet capture file. So then I can go about and say, can you please reassemble these individual sessions and show me what was in there? I'm going to grab, let's say, session 10. Here, what I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, Wireshark, I am trying to read out of this capture file that I made earlier. I want to follow the TCP stream, meaning I'm going to give you a stream number, stream number 10. And I want you to reassemble the TCP transaction that happened for stream number 10. So include all the packets. And what I'm looking for is the ASCII payload data for that stream of packets. All right, so this is a HTTP connection, but it looks like maybe it was a HTTPS connection. Right. So that's why all that stuff there at the top of the screen is goopy because that's encapsulated in secure socket layer encrypted traffic transmitted between these two hosts. 
So that's not super helpful. And it's also why we like using encrypted connections. It's not super useful. Right. Um, but I did make another connection where it was port 80, right? Port 80 is the web port. It does not use SSL encryption. So if I recall the same command, but I say, hey, rebuild for me session number 21. So here's session number 21. Session 21 is a HTTP get request. And it went out to this host and it responded back with 342 bytes of data. And it gives me a header for the HTML content that I'm getting back. And then down at the bottom, there's the actual HTML that was transferred. And so if I curled this machine, That was the web page that was transferred to me. And right. you can see in the T log capture, there is. is the exact web page that was transferred to me. You've got the syntax at the top that I could have typed in Telnet to get the HTTP response I was looking for. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> but if this was like a login page where I provided login credentials, guess what? That right. would have been in plain text across the HTTP connection. And I would have captured that in this data too. So any images could have been transferred and there would be, it would look in my ASCII output is like goopy. Yeah, it could but be you reassembled. Can, you can grab that segment and actually send it to an image viewer and see what image was transferred. Like you get the whole transaction that was transferred. Somebody could snoop on your cat pictures. It, well, yes. But this is why we love <laughs> uh, secure socket layer based connections. And we want to use things like encrypted technologies like SSH instead of Telnet, because we don't want someone to be able to capture our packets and then exactly. the data that was transmitted to them. This is also why we don't do things like non SSL based authentication, because someone will capture your username and password that you are sending over non encrypted web traffic. Now, one caveat, which I've been kind of holding in the back of my brain since you did the first example, if you're on a system that gets a ton of traffic and you don't have a lot of filters applied to that packet capture, it will accumulate data very quickly, it could even produce a noticeable strain on the system, right? So just keep that in mind. If you're on like your production web server and you're trying to do some troubleshooting, be careful how long you run packet captures for and what you're capturing, because it could get big quickly. I think that's the real concern, the size of the file that you're creating, that you're saving into. Yeah. Realize you're doing a whole bunch of disk IO now to yep. save the packets onto it. And that's where the strain comes from. The strain yeah. is not capturing the actual networking data. That's passing through your machine anyway. Your kernel and yeah. everybody looking at it anyway. It's more right. the like taking it out of the network stack and saving it to a file that that is the extra process here with, uh, with T-Shark. I think that may be it that I want to show, but let me also do a T shark dash R. I showed this earlier. This is like the packets that were captured. You get their packet ID about the two hosts that were part of that connection, what type of connection it was and some data about the connection that was made with this one packet. So you can go even to like individual packets. What I did with the stream ID is I took an individual packet and said, this is part of a larger series of connections made with this piece of protocol. Isolate all the packets associated with this connection and then reassemble what happened there. So where the stream ID stuff came into play.